Hi there. So today I want to do a review. I hope it's a review. Um, this should be covered in the second semester of introductory physics, but I'd like to cover the um, semi-classical Drude model of electrical conduction, um, which should be covered in second semester physics, and then discuss what's wrong with the model. Um, so that, that will lead into a discussion of the correct model using Fermi-Dirac statistics. This is covered in the end of chapter 10 and also a little bit in the beginning of chapter 11. So to discuss metallic bonding, the model of metallic bonding goes like this. You have a lattice, a regular array of atoms. And each one of these metal atoms donates one, two, three, however many electrons it would like, um, which is favored by what the valence structure of the uh, atom looks like. It donates those electrons to the C, okay, an electron C. So then what you're left with is a, uh, a lattice of ionic cores and then these electrons that are donated move freely about the lattice and because you have these pod positive lattice um, sites surrounded by this negative um, C of electrons, you have on the whole a neutral system. Um, the positive cores are shielded from the mutually repulsive Coulomb forces by these free electrons. Now these free electrons can go anywhere and that makes these bonds non-directional. Okay, so this is unlike um, the covalent bonding and a little bit more like ionic bonding in that sense, that it's non-directional. Now there's a lot of interesting properties that come from having this sea of electrons. First of all, the fact that you have these electrons that are free, that can move around the lattice wherever they would like, that makes them very good thermal and electrical conductors. And they also lead into some of the properties of metals that you might be familiar with, such as the ductility and the malleability of metals. It's easy to draw them into wires, it's easy to deform them, um, and that's because when the metal is, say, for example, hammered on, the overall composition of the structure isn't harmed. The protons, the, the ionic cores, they may be rearranged, that may move around, but the sea of electrons keep that metal intact. And also it leads to the luster and shininess of metals. Those free electrons can absorb the photons um, in the sea, and so that makes them opaque instead of translucent or transparent. But also it causes them to bounce back light at the same frequency that the light hits the surface, and so it looks shiny. Okay, so those are some of the properties of metals. That's the general model. Now to get more into the specifics, especially regarding the electrical current and the conduction, um, we're going to discuss these charge carriers moving through a conductor. And this is the Druda model of conduction. Now when they first came up with these models, um, it, they wanted to be sort of versatile in whether the charge carriers were, you know, positive charge carriers or negative charge car carriers. Um, so remember that, thanks to Ben Franklin, the charge carrier in a circuit is said to be positive. So this model shows a positive charge carrier, and it might be a positive charge carrier, for example, if you're doing electrochemistry, where you have ions flowing through a solution. So it's not entirely incorrect. For a metal, though, remember that the charge carriers are these free electrons. Okay, so Anyway, we're going to say that we have a wire, all right? A uh, cylindrical wire is shown here. Um, your cross-sectional area there is a circle, but whatever, it doesn't have to be. Anyway, you have some amount of charge that's passing through some cross-sectional area A in some amount of time delta T. And in that case, then your current is defined as delta Q over delta T, where delta Q is the charge and delta T is the time. That makes the SI unit of um, current the amp, which is one coulomb per second. It's a very large unit of um, current, as you might know if you're familiar with messing with, cir uh, with circuits. Anyway, you have these charged particles. They're moving through that conductor with a cross-sectional area. Let's just say that your conductor can give or donate a certain number of charge carriers per unit volume of the material. This makes sense if you think about it in terms of the model that we discussed with the atoms donating one electron, say, per atom. And you have a certain number of atoms per unit volume, and so that means that you have a certain number of charge carriers per unit volume. We're going to call that charge carrier density N, okay? And it's basically just got units of inverse volume or inverse meter cubed um, if you want to put it in SI units. 
Now, that would mean that the total number of charge carriers would be the number of charge carriers per unit volume multiplied by the volume. And for our little cylindrical wire here, that volume would be the cross-sectional area times delta x, where delta x would be the length of the wire that it travels through in some time delta t. Okay, so you have then the total charge is the number of carriers times the charge per carrier cube, right? So you have your total number of carriers times your charge per carrier. That gives you the total charge, big delta Q, that goes through that uh, cross-sectional area in our time. And so big delta Q is equal to Na delta X times little q. Now your drift speed, which we're going to call V sub D, is the speed at which the carriers move in the wire. And so V sub D would be the length of the wire that it moves through delta X divided by the time delta T. And we could rearrange that so that delta X is equal to V sub D times delta T. Now we're going to rewrite our charge delta Q, our total charge delta Q. And if we do that, plugging in for our expression for delta X, then we have Na V sub D delta T times Q. And then we plug back into our expression for the current, which remember was big delta Q over delta T, and we have NQ V sub D times A. All right? So that gives us our current. Now, just to put this into an example problem to help you cement it into your head, let's just um, put it in terms of some numbers that might feel good to you. All right, so we have a typical wire for lab experiments is copper. You probably know that copper is a great conductor and it gets used in a lot of wiring that you might find in a home. Let's say that the wire has a radius of 0.815 millimeters and calculate the drift velocity of the electrons in the wire when the current is one amp, assuming one free electron per copper atom. The density of copper, you can look it up, 8.93 grams per cubic centimeter and the molar mass of copper is 63.55 grams per mole. So plugging into this formula that I defined in a previous slide, I is equal to NQA V sub D. The charge per carrier is the charge on an electron. The magnitude of that charge is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The problem told us that the current was 1 amp, so we'll plug that in. The cross-sectional area would be the area of a circle that has the um, radius of the wire. So that would be pi r squared, which is pi times 0 0.815 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared, which gives us a cross-sectional area of 2.1 times 10 to the minus 6 square meters. Now we're going to solve for n. We have to do a unit conversion here. Basically we've got the density of the wire in grams per centimeters cubed. The first thing is to change that centimeters cubed into meters cubed. We've done that here. There's 100 centimeters and 1 meter and then we remember we have to cube everything. Okay. Now we've got to make a unit change from the number of grams into the number of conduction electrons. So we're going to do that reading off the periodic table and getting the molar mass. So if you look at the periodic table, you can see that one mole of um, copper has a mass of 63.55 grams. Remember, the conversion, if you read off the periodic table, <laughs> the mass of one atom, the average mass of one atom, can be read in atomic mass units. And that's also the mass in grams of one mole of the material. We set the conversion up that way specifically so that we could read it off the periodic table. That's why we define the mole the way that we define it. Okay, anyway, so we can do that conversion. We can get rid of grams, convert to moles, and then we just have to remember that one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Now I didn't put this in the equation because copper only donates one electron for every atom, but there's an understood one electron per atom on the end there. And then you multiply by everything on the top, divide by everything on the bottom, and then you get your charge carrier density as 8.46 times 10 to the 28th electrons per cubic meter. Okay? Now, we have everything that we need, so remember, here's our equation for the current, I is equal to NQA V sub D. So solving for V sub D, I'd have I over NQA, plugging in for all the numbers that I've shown here, that gives me a drift velocity of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. 
Now it's a relatively slow drift, drift velocity. Remember we covered in second semester introductory physics that the drift velocity being slow doesn't mean that that's how fast the current moves through the wire necessarily. You've got a current moving through, but that's because the field is applied. The field is applied through the whole wire pretty much all at once or anyway at the speed of light in the material. And then that causes all the charge carriers in the wire pretty much to start moving instantaneously. So if you flip your white light switch, the light flips on pretty much instantaneously as soon as you flip it because the field is established everywhere in the wire almost all at once. Okay, now that's all well and good, but our current is set up and it depends on the cross-sectional area of the wire. And we'd rather have an expression that doesn't have that area dependence in there because we'd like it to be valid for whatever wire. So we define the current density of a conductor. We usually use a J to symbolize that. And the current density is the current per unit area, or I over A, okay? So if we use our expression for I and divide by A, then that gives us that J is equal to NQ V sub D, okay? This expression is valid only if the current density is uniform and A is perpendicular to the direction of current. J has SI units of amps per square meter, and remember that the current density is the vector that's defined as the direction of positive charge carriers, although remember that points opposite the direction of charge flow in a normal wire, which is made of metal, with electrons as the current carrying object. Okay, now, Ohm's law. Um, here's a picture of uh, George Ohm here on the right. Um, Ohm's law states that for many materials, metals, things like that. The ratio of the current density to the electric field is some constant. That constant we defined as the conductivity, usually indicated by sigma. And it's independent of the electric field that produces the current. It depends on the material, okay? So the conductivity is a material property. So most metals obey Ohm's law. So you can write that mathematically as J is equal to sigma E, where E is your electric field, and J is your current density, and sigma is your conductivity. And if a material does obey Ohm's law, it's said to be ohmic. Now, the electrical conduction model that describes Ohm's law and sort of explains it is the Druda model of electrical conduction. It's a semi-classical model. And since it's semi-classical, it will ultimately fail. It was conceived before quantum mechanics. However, it was a triumph in that it kind of qualitatively explained a lot of the things that they saw about metals. All right, so in the Druda model, you can treat Treat the conductor as a regular array of atoms and a collection of free electrons. I should say ions and a collection of free electrons. We already talked about that. And in the absence of an electric field, you've still got your conduction electrons moving around. It's important to understand that they're never still. Okay, we'll see later that your conduction electrons actually move at very, very high speeds, even at zero Kelvin. But the thing is, you don't have a net current flow because the motion is random. It's just as likely to be being left as right, forward as backward, and up and down. Okay, So the net motion is zero in the absence of an electric field. When an electric field is applied, though, your conduction electrons are given that net drift velocity. What we're going to assume is that the electron's motion after a collision is independent of its motion before the collision, and also that any excess energy acquired by the electrons in the field is lost to the atoms of the conductor when the electrons and the atoms collide, causing the temperature to increase. So this is where the heating comes from in a wire um, as current is passed through it. Remember that that is a process which makes your wire really, really hot. Okay, so you have this sort of semi-chaotic motion of these electrons bouncing around all over the place. They have a lot, a lot, a lot of collisions, okay? And these collisions cause the drift velocity to be relatively low. We saw in the previous problem about 10 to the minus 5 meters per second, something like that. Even though the fields, if the electron didn't have stuff to run into, would cause the electrons to really zip, okay? Okay, so... Let's put this in terms of some semi-classical physics here. We have the force experienced by an electron in a field is F is equal to QE, all right? If you set QE equals MA, then you can solve for the acceleration, and the acceleration would be QE over M. Here, from here on out, if I say M, it's the mass of an electron, okay? Now, if you used 
um, those kinematics equations, then you would have the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. Plugging in for the acceleration, you have the initial velocity plus QE over M times time. Now since the initial velocities are in some random direction, if you took this average value, the average value would be zero. So we're just going to set that initial velocity in these equations from here on out equal to zero. Let's say that the average time that an electron has in between all those crazy collisions that it makes, we're going to call that tau, okay? That's the mean free time. The average value of the final velocity would then be your drift velocity. Okay, and your drift velocity would be equal to QE tau over M. Now, this is also related to your current density, right? So, since we have J is equal to NQ V sub D, now we can plug that V sub D expression that we just derived into our equation for J. And then we have NQ squared E over the mass of the electron times tau. Remember that N is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Okay, now if you set this expression that we had for J, the NQ squared E um, tau over mass of the electron, and you set that equal to sigma E, then you can solve for the conductivity sigma, and you get NQ squared tau over the mass. Now remember, sometimes we speak in terms of the resistivity of the material. The resistivity is the inverse of the conductivity, so if you want an expression for the resistivity, it would be the mass over NQ squared tau. All right? Now note, this is a material property. It doesn't depend upon the strength of the field, all right? So you're going to have a certain conductivity, say, for copper. You'll have a different one for silver. Um, just because the densities in the material are different, the number of electrons that it donates to the C might be different, things like that. Now, this actually is a pretty successful model. It explains qualitatively, but not quantitatively. We'll talk about that in a second. Ohm's law. So it did explain why the, um, the current density was proportional to the electric field, and it did a pretty good job at predicting your conductivities, but they were off numerically, as we'll see. And it also introduces some important concepts that we still use today, like the idea of a mean-free path and a mean-free time. Your mean-free time is tau, and sometimes we use a mean-free path symbolized by different letters, sometimes L, sometimes lambda, or whatever. Um, you define your mean-free path uh, by your mean-free time and your drift velocity. Okay, but there were problems with it. Okay, there were problems with it. Your conductivity values predicted by the Druda model were about an order of magnitude too small. So they got kind of close, but not really. So this is the free electron gas model. And there were some problems in the differences between uh, the dependence on temperature. Okay, so according to the classical model, you should see speeds that were proportional to the square root of your temperature, which would mean that your conductivity would be inversely proportional to the square root of your temperature. Let me explain why. So remember, equipartition of energy says that your kinetic energy should equal to 3 halves kT. Kinetic energy here would be defined as 1 half the mass of the electron times the drift velocity squared, and you'd set that equal to 3 halves kT. If you then solve for your drift velocity, you would get square root of 3 kT over m, where t is your temperature, k is Boltzmann's constant. All right? Now, if you want to plug into the conductivity, remember our expression for the conductivity was n e squared tau over the mass. And then tau was equal to mean free time, which is mean free path L over your drift velocity. Plugging that all back into your conductivity, you get n e squared mean free path divided by the drift velocity divided by the mass. Plugging in to our expression for the drift velocity, root 3 kT over m, we have our conductivity was n e squared l over the square root of 3 kT m. So this would show that the conductivity was inversely proportional to the square root of the temperature. But that's not what we see in experiment. In experiment, we see that the conductivity is inversely proportional to the temperature. Not the square root of the temperature, just inversely proportional to the temperature. And so the model didn't work, all right? Another big problem with the model was that it gave incorrect values by the, of, for the heat capacity. Incorrect by a lot, okay? So if we go back to that equipartition of energy, then you have three degrees of vibration in a three-dimensional solid. So the model goes like you have these little atoms that are connected by these springs, right? And the springs go up, down, left, right, and side to side. 
Okay, so that's three directions, three degrees of freedom for the vibration, which gives you six total degrees of freedom. Remember that we said that your kinetic and your potential energies each act as a degree of freedom for one direction of vibration, and then three times two is six. Okay, so for your oscillation, you'd have six times one half r, which gives you three r for the oscillation. And then um, for your translation of your electrons, you'd have another three degrees of freedom um, for the electrons to be able to move in x, y, and z. And that would give you three halves r for the translation of the electrons in three dimensions, which would give you a total heat capacity that should be proportional to nine halves times the gas constant r. That's what the theory would show. The reality is that it's way, way smaller than that, about 0.02 times r. So the models failed. Um, it failed in some really important ways, and it took Fermi-Dirac statistics to save it, and that will be covered in the next lecture.